So now this final video on respiration, what we're going to conclude is our discussion on gas exchange by entitling the last flowchart, Gas Exchange 2. In this flowchart, what we want to look at more specifically is how oxygen binds to hemoglobin. This is a big idea in terms of how gas exchange is going to occur. This idea of binding of oxygen is known as cooperative oxygen binding, cooperative O2 binding. This process of cooperative O2 binding is shown in figure 42.20a. So 42.20a is what we'll be focusing on for right now. So what does this really mean? So what we have to first understand is that hemoglobin itself as a molecule that transports oxygen um, has to combine with oxygen and then let go of oxygen. So we state that hemoglobin binds to oxygen in a reversible form. So we'll say it binds to oxygen reversibly. It can bind to oxygen or, oxygen or it can let go of oxygen. We can more specifically or more appropriately state that it loads oxygen at certain times and that's specifically going to be at the lung so that's a certain place at which it loads oxygen and then it also has the capability of unloading oxygen and it unloads at the tissues. The tissues are places where cell respiration, aerobic respiration specifically, is happening and therefore places that need oxygen to be that terminal electron acceptor. That's the purpose of it in cell respiration. Now, in order for this reversible oxygen loading and unloading to occur correctly, it's going to all be enhanced by this idea of cooperativity. So it's all enhanced by the cooperative nature. Cooperativity is the term here that oxygen displays when it's being bound to hemoglobin. So, what is cooperativity and how does it relate to overall gas exchange? What we want to state is the following. When you have an oxygen molecule, when this O2 molecule binds to a hemoglobin, it's not going to bind to every single hemoglobin, actually. Remember, there are four polypeptide chains, right? Each of which has a heme group. The heme group, or the iron atom, is the actual structure that will bind to the oxygen molecule. So there are four heme groups, there, therefore there's four possible oxygen molecules that can bind. But what cooperativity states is the following. When oxygen molecules, when an oxygen molecule, an oxygen molecule binds to the first heme group, the first subunit, let's say, the first hemoglobin subunit, this is going to cause, this is initially going to be actually kind of hard to bind to the first one. But after it binds to the first one, the other three subunits actually change their shape. The other three subunits change their biochemical shape and their arrangement. This shape change after the first hemoglobin binding to the, the hemoglobin binding to oxygen at that subunit level is going to allow the other three subunits to increase their affinity, increase their attraction, their want to bind to oxygen. So this is the cooperative nature. Once you get one oxygen molecule in the hemoglobin subunit, the other hemoglobin subunits will change their shape to want another oxygen molecule to bind to them. And therefore, this overall cooperative nature of oxygen binding to hemoglobin causes the more likely scenario of oxygen to be loaded. So you will now get a hemoglobin molecule that is more likely to load oxygen. So basically it goes like this. The first hemoglobin molecule, it's hard to bind to oxygen. But after that, the second one, it's a little bit easier. And then on the third one, it's even easier. And then on the fourth one, it is so easy. We increase the affinity as we bind to each and every hemoglobin subunit. So it's basically an, a, a stepwise proportional increase as to how much and how, uh, uh, how successfully we're able to bind to oxygen in this loading of hemoglobin. This loading of hemoglobin is cooperative and so is the unloading. There's also going to be
cooperative unloading. It's the same idea, just in reverse. So what's going to happen is, initially, that first subunit is really not going to want to give up its oxygen molecule. But once the first subunit, the first subunit to give up its oxygen molecule, to unload that oxygen molecule at the tissue, does it? Once the first subunit unloads, this makes it so much easier for the other subunits to do the same thing. So we state that the others are therefore more likely to unload as well. This idea of doing something after somebody else does the initial job of it the first time is the cooperativity of oxygen binding, oxygen loading, and unloading. Now, the thing that really defines whether or not this will happen or whether or not this will happen, are you going to load oxygen or are you going to unload oxygen, is actually, again, a law that we're quite familiar with. And that's all about partial pressures, specifically of the gas in question, in interest, which is oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen is exclusively what determines and what primarily determines um, if a hemoglobin loads or unloads oxygen. So if hemoglobin loads slash unloads. So where is this seen and when is it seen? Well, sometimes we have an increased partial pressure of oxygen. When is that? Well, whenever we have an increased pres partial pressure of oxygen, this means hemoglobin will load, and this means this is probably happening, the loading of oxygen on a red blood cell, on a hemoglobin subunit, on a heme group, is happening at the lungs. Doesn't that make sense? At the lungs is where we get our air from the outside to the inside. That's where we get that high concentration of oxygen. That's where we should definitely load hemoglobin. So it very much aligns with everything we've been talking about. What if and where do we get a partial pressure that is low in oxygen? Well, that would, of course, mean that you're not going to load oxygen now. You're going to unload it. And where is the number one place to unload oxygen? Cells that need it. Places like tissues that are actively doing aerobic cell respiration in desperate need of oxygen to help do cell work and cell respiration as a whole. So again, here comes that idea of partial pressures driving everything. Now, a concept to know about this cooperative binding of oxygen, um, a very, uh, very much important process is the idea that there could possibly be also something known as a Bohr shift in terms of the cooperative binding that you see. The Bohr shift is exemplified in figure 43.20b, right next to this figure over here. This basically just means that if you have a decreased pH, that's blood pH, this directly results in a decreased O2 affinity. And the affinity that we're talking about is between oxygen loading onto hemoglobin or unloading from hemoglobin. So when do we see this? When do we see a decreased affinity for oxygen? Um, that's during a low pH. And when do we get a low pH? We've talked about this before. A low pH is observed when the concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood is very high. A good time at which this is happening good example of which you have an increased CO2 concentration within your blood is during exercise. So when you're exercising, you know how you always have to breathe a lot or usually you're breathing a lot while you're exercising. The reason why is because the pH of your blood is decreasing. If the pH of your blood is decreasing, that means hemoglobin is not very good at keeping a hold of oxygen. So guess what's going to happen? The tissues that are actively running, pushing weight, picking up weight, doing whatever active, uh, active muscle scenario or activity that's necessary, those tissues are going to constantly want oxygen. And guess what? There's a low partial pressure of oxygen at where they are because there's a low pH at where they are, because there's lots of CO2 at where an active muscle is working, because it's doing so much cell respiration. So clearly during exercise, it makes sense that you want a low oxygen affinity on hemoglobin, because that means hemoglobin will definitely unload oxygen, because it doesn't want to hold on to it. It's a low pH. If there's a high CO2 concentration, it really wants to get rid of oxygen, and that's exactly what happens at the exercising tissues. So really nice uh, clinical example there.
Finally, the last thing we want to speak about during our about gas exchange is the idea of what happens to the CO2, because CO2 is the other 50% of this equation. So let's conclude by looking at what happens during CO2 blood transport. First of all, about 7% of the CO2 that's produced by cells is going to be dissolved in the plasma, and that's how it's sort of going to transport throughout and away from the body. So it'll be within the plasma of the blood. But the majority of the CO2 is actually not going to follow this dissolved route. Instead, the majority of the CO2, the remainder, in other words, of the CO2, diffuses from the plasma. It does not stay there, but diffuses from the plasma back into the red blood cell. So it actually goes right into the red blood cells. Why is that? Well, this is because the red blood cells are going to be the site of a very important reaction you should remember. And that is the combination of CO2 plus H2O, which is well abundant within the blood, is going to reversibly yield the H2CO3 compound known as, known as carbonic acid. And this is then going to reversibly also break down into two molecules known as H plus ions and also a bicarbonate HCO3 minus ion. This equation is occurring within the red blood cell. This is constantly happening. How does this result in effective CO2 blood transport? Well, first of all, the end result of this equation really the majority of the time it's going to push forward towards the right side over here. These are the majority of the products that are formed during CO2 blood transport. So we have to deal with this and we have to deal with this. How do we do that? Well in terms of the H plus ion, the positive proton right there, most of that, most of that H plus actually directly binds to a hemoglobin molecule that's already in the red blood cell. And that will deal with it. That's all we need to know about that. Most of it just binds back to the hemoglobin molecule on the red blood cell. What's really of importance to us is figuring out what do we do with this, this bicarbonate ion. Well, with the bicarbonate ion, most of that, the HCO3 minus, is actually transported in the blood. It flows with the blood, transported in blood, right to the place at which CO2 is released. That's to the lungs. Okay, that's good. We got HCO3 to the lungs. But that's not enough yet, because once it gets to the lungs, that's when it has the capability of reversibly going back into its CO2 form, and it does that in the lungs, and once it does that, it diffuses out of the blood at the lungs. So it diffuses out of blood, so we'll write that down, out of blood at the lungs. And once it diffuses out of blood at the lungs, this is then going to cause a decreased amount of CO2 overall within the blood. And when you have a decreased amount of CO2, this actually causes more of the conversion. It pushes forward this conversion of HCO3 minus to a CO2 believe it or not. So when the more CO2 you're losing, the more you're converting to CO2. It's basically a way to make up for the loss. But this is actually very purposeful to decrease CO2 and then make CO2 again because this is what allows you to constantly make sure that lots of exhaled CO2 is happening. You are constantly exhaling CO2 because the reaction pushes itself forward constantly in this exact mechanism that we went over. That completes our look at respiration. Overall through this, hopefully you can see the super connectiveness between the circulatory system and the respiration system. Uh, it's a really nice overall uh, and very much connected process. Hopefully you've gained a greater appreciation for this system and we'll conclude in our final lecture of Biology 116 on excretion.